And um, so afterwards we will have uh, some questioning and we will um, uh, go around with the microphone. And I will be, so my name is Tom Beekman and I'm assisted um, by my very friendly colleague here, uh, Sirgi Saar from Estonia. And uh, we will hope this will be uh, an exciting session. So first uh, speaker is, uh, I'd like to introduce, I'm uh, really pleased to introduce, is actually from uh, the a country with, with the best football players. Uh, <laughs> and it's happened to be also my, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it happens to be also my, my own country. So I'm happy to announce you, uh, Xavier Dreyer, for this in, uh, invited lecture with the title Root, Sy Root Systems Architecture Beyond Geometry, New Opportunities or Undue Complexity. And here you have already first time the word complexity. Please, Xavier. Thank you very much, Tom, for the uh, introduction, and thanks the organizer for the uh, uh, invitation to talk about this uh, uh, exciting topic that you don't see on the screen. Uh, well, there is a perfect match. Maybe some of you wonder why there is such a best match between the title of the session and the title of my talk. It's because I have good friends in the local organizing committee, I think. So uh, thanks, Abraham. Um, so um, I'm not a specialist of uh, complexity. This is a special uh, scientific discipline, uh, but this is a field where I feel more comfortable when <coughs> things are complicated. Um, so, uh, as you understand, I'm not going to make your life easy. I'm not supposed to, uh, but uh, I will try to do my best um, anyway. So, uh, my talk will be organized around three uh, examples. Uh, don't pay too much attention to the examples. My, my hope is that you will catch the message between uh, the lines, uh, the, the, the lines. So, and I will start with uh, an example uh, which is familiar to uh, Roberto in the audience, uh, trying to explain you what I mean by complexity, because there are many areas, in, and especially in root research, where we can talk about complexity. So, uh, we actually, in the framework of the uh, DROPS European project, conduct a very uh, useful uh, experiment where we could grow the same panel of 100 maize genotypes along a slope field with a stable and uh, uniform horizontal water table. So uh, the same genotype were growing with different depths of uh, water in the same field, so same weather condition. Um, so wha what we observed, and here we only highlight three of those uh, genotypes, is that we actually, this is a proxy for transpiration, so it's a uh, leaf temperature uh, indexed multiplied by leaf area uh, as a function of uh, grain yield and what we see is basically physics is the trade-off between entry of CO2 and the exit of water so a very nice correlation uh, but what we wanted to highlight here is that we had in this setup uh, genotypes that were actually very much stressed and the same genotypes being very much comfortable in terms of water uh, so this validates so the same sort of response in terms of uh, plant height. Now, uh, the complexity comes when we try to understand what is behind this relationship, and then we start to compare different genotypes. So here we have a proxy of uh, stomatal conductance. It's a field proxy based on the leaf temperature again, and uh, grain yield. Um, so when, when you look at the different uh, genotypes, MS-153 uh, is one that is worth to be highlighted. So the different uh, symbols correspond to different depths of uh, water in the soil. You see that this genotype was essentially completely insensitive. So th the basic hypothesis would be that's a deep root genotype and it can do exactly the same job, whatever. So it, it is accessing the water table in all conditions. And this was confirmed, uh, MS-153 in phenotyping platform also seems to have a deep uh, root system. Uh, the other extreme would be F894, uh, which you see doesn't seem to regulate at all uh, its stomatal conductance, but shows very contrasting uh, yield. So essentially due to different leaf size, so leaf elongation rate was dramatically affected. And so the most likely hypothesis would be there is an access to water issue for this genotype, which prevented it to uh, 
produce uh, to, to sustain leaf elongation. But okay, that these are two extreme. I would say easy game. Now, if you look at the other ones, you see all sorts of uh, differences in gradual uh, difference between uh, those genotypes. Some with a narrow range of stomatal response, but very large range of grain yield, uh, pH 207, which just does the opposite. So things become complicated when you try to interpret those genotypes in between. Now, this was an experiment focused on root depth because essentially what differs between the different treatments is the depth of water table. So we can think a little bit more what is root depth. Uh, essentially, that's uh, yeah, the depth of root. But where does this trait come from in terms of uh, ontology and uh, growth of the root system? Well, root depth is essentially uh, uh, root growth rate times duration of elongation. That's what the modeler would say. It's, a, it's an easy game. If you start to look carefully where roots are actually growing, this was in Wallonia, so a very deep uh, clay loamy soil. And so you, you know this concept of uh, blue rain experiments. So you make an artificial rain with the blue uh, water. Then you dig a trench and you analyze carefully to see. And so you, you will see the cracks in the soil where water flows preferentially. And you can co map the position of the roots. And essentially, uh, if you go below 10 centimeters, the roots are always in the preferential flow area where the uh, water is actually going. So actually, looking at roots in such a sort of a type of field is probably a complex way to reveal what is the soil structure. So root depth in some conditions is essentially a proxy of soil structure, or a little bit the opposite. So structure gives you root depth. So uh, just to mention that a simple trait like root depth, if you want to really interpret what's happening behind, where is the chicken, where is the egg, might be something difficult. So now the, I would say the dominating view in the field of root system architecture for nutrient uptake, so inter relation with uh, root function, is something that was proposed by Jonathan Lynch, but Michel Ward is also involved in in, in these uh, ideas. And this is something which has made this proof, so it works it's, uh, in a number of circumstances. It's essentially try to, it was based initially on uh, modeling uh, simulation, try to optimize how you allocate your carbon in the different region of the soil, taking as an advantage that every root type can have a specific type of behavior. So you can play with the different type of roots so that at the end of the day or at the end of the crop, you have maintained the game of having the right roots at the right place when the plant needs it. And this is the match that you would like to maintain. So but this, this view is actually very much geometry centrist. Uh, there is no mention of plasticity. There is no mention of soil root interactions. It's something that should, in principle, work on average in an average scenario. So you say it's a late stress or it's a deep water or different scenario. Well, the, you have to adapt this to a specific scenario and on average it should work. But it does not necessarily work uh, in all conditions. So where I would like to go with my talk, I mentioned three stories. Is first, I would like to know whether geometry is only the different root types and their position. Can we go, are there some rules behind geometry? And for that, I'm going to go back to the origin of geometry, which is essentially the growth and developmental processes behind geometry. The second one is uh, what would be, what could be the contribution of plasticity. There is a lot of things going on in root developmental uh, biology uh, ongoing in terms of uh, plastic response of roots. How do we interpret that in, uh, for example, water deficit uh, tolerance? And the, the last part will be about uh, what could be beyond geometry. Are there other traits that actually make sense with geometry in addition to, and that would probably change the, the way we look at the system. So my first avenue is about rules behind uh, root system architecture. So uh, as I mentioned, we, we are going to follow the uh, going back to the root growth dynamic and we designed a platform that will uh, allow us 
to monitor that dynamics of very high, very high temporal resolution to capture the changes in growth rate for different types of fruits. Uh, so we are able to grow close to 1,000 plants for three weeks with a two hours time resolution. In two hours, the primary root will grow by one or two millimeters, so it's very uh, fine resolution with a high, uh, sorry, spatial uh, resolution also. And we are focusing on root elongation for individual roots, the dynamics of root emergence, and to some extent, uh, the tropism uh, and the angles. So, um, okay, I said it. I did it on the Mac, and obviously uh, I didn't have the same font, <laughs> so some of the text is, is cut. Um, the first slide is about seminal and nodal roots. The story will be different for the laterals. What we observed, so we actually uh, used a diversity panel with 90 maze lines. It was a very broad one with the uh, 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 main type of uh, maze diversity. What we observed, so one graph is one plant, one color is one root, and you have the evolution of length as a function of age, and you see the production of the successive lateral, the, the successive uh, nodal, seminal and nodal roots of maize. Mostly, one big conclusion of that is roots are able, I say able because it's aeroponics, are able to grow at a constant rate for the complete, well, at least for uh, the duration of the experiment. So that was sort of a surprise because it's in a greenhouse, so temperature is changing all the time. It's not a very much control. Um, from different plants from different genotypes, you will see that the emergence dynamic can be different. Some will be more continuous, some will produce their nodules in batches. Um, in some genotypes, we'll have different growth rates for the roots. But when we try to interpret, yeah, then the, good, the, the important things to say is we had a very high irritability in the panel, between 60 and 80 percent uh, for uh, growth rate. So when we try to interpret the fact that this is linear, there is one indirect conclusion, which is easy to, to make, is that the, emer the, the growth rate of a root is established when that root emerges. It doesn't change after. So the decision has been taken very early during the life of uh, the root. So that, that, that is something we have to take uh, for granted. The second point is trying to interpret. Maybe this means or it should mean that the system is geared by producing new roots and establishing the growth rate of the successive root in a way that the first root can keep going and never be uh, refrained because there is a lack for carbon or something like this. Okay? So the, the, the plant is able to, to make this. So maybe this is a matter of the older roots keep priority and then the second one does adjust to what is available at that moment. But you, you need to consider that during that time, we have three leaf uh, production events. So the, the, the carbon allocation and carbon use has been quite messy during that period. So it's not necessary yet. And so that, that was across the complete panel, the R-square of this uh, relationship suggesting this is definitely linear. And we can assume it is. Now if we go to uh, lateral roots. Lateral roots, the story is very different. So we can start from the uh, closer picture here, which is in maize where you see between long laterals, you have some smaller ones. So in 1975, uh, MacLeod published using this uh, as a proof that uh, root for lateral root formation in maize is not acropetal because we had short between long, but that was the high D behind that they all have the same growth rate. So now that we are able to track and to monitor growth rate, uh, what actually was shown, uh, it was a two theses in parallel in Bertrand Buller and Laurent Laplace lab in Montpellier, showed actually by monitoring and tracking the elongation rate of many individual ro lateral roots that you have essentially, well, that the, the three colors come from the statistical analysis, three classes of roots. One class is where the root growth starts and their growth rate tend to stabilize and diminish quite quickly and they stop growing. These are those very small ones and they have a specific, very simple, small diameter and very simple uh, cross-section anatomical structure. Uh, you have a second class of roots that tend to grow <laughs> and maintain the growth rate, and you have the larger one, this is the diameter, that tend to accelerate over time 
and which have a more complicated. Uh, so wh what this tells us is that there is intrinsically, this is in a system where everything is supposed to be homogeneous. So there is sort of an intrinsic biological noise or something behind that makes maize grow in that way. And we have seen that for many genotypes. And so it seems to be a constant in maize. So we will come back later to the pot potential biological significance. Uh, oops. <coughs> Sorry. So the, the second avenue that I wanted to explore is the question of uh, plasticity. And I take it from the point of view of developmental plasticity. The reason is that we are today, and this, is, this comes from a, a review from uh, Jose Dinoni showing uh, that when a root is growing uh, in a soil, it encounters a very heterogeneous substrate. And in every position for every type of uh, environment, lo very local environment, uh, sometimes plants or roots, individual roots, show uh, very specific responses. So hydrotropism is when root change direction when it is uh, exposed to a gradient of uh, water or moisture. Uh, root cortical erenchyma, uh, hydropatterning, where uh, a root starts to produce a lateral only in the direction where there is water and not in the opposite direction. So why I want to talk about those is that these are local responses. So they make sense in terms of local gradients. But they obviously will have an effect on the final root architecture. So we might want to say, OK, the roots have been going into this direction, and it's important for, I don't know, taking up water in this layer of soil. But the decision was taken based on information that was local, maybe a root entering a macropore. Would you take a decision of root architecture that will have an effect on long-term structure based on what you see on a one millimeter distance? This is a, a question that we probably have to address if we want to make a real um, so I would like to explain a newcomer in this uh, list of uh, local response, uh, which we uh, discovered just uh, incidentally uh, by stopping uh, spray of nutrient solution in an aeroponic system uh, during the night. Well, you, we just plugged the pump on the right, on the wrong uh, plug in the greenhouse. And we discovered that there was a, it was ex extremely nicely reproducible, a repression of lateral root formation. So we have done uh, detailed analysis to know which was the stage. It was something that blocked very early uh, in, the, in the life of these laterals. Uh, we compared uh, the, exp the, 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 the amount of uh, ABA in, in roots being stressed or not. We, you, you, need, you need to take into account, <coughs> these are response that we see within less than two hours time. So it's a very fast response. Be, in, during that time, the root has grown by one millimeter or two millimeters. So if we will have to interpret this uh, in, in terms of that. So uh, Beata Orman in, in, in our lab and in Tom's lab also was really uh, persuasive in trying to find, uh, she actually showed that it was possible to reproduce this uh, with uh, transient ABA treatment. So ABA was causing the same uh, re uh, arrest of response. So applying ABA for two hours, for example, at concentration which are a bit lower than what is used in long-term ABA experiment, which uh, uh, have a different type of effect. The beauty of uh, showing this with ABA was that it was then possible to reproduce this in Arabidopsis. Because Arabidopsis in aeroponics, I, you, you can try to grow it, but uh, you will have some surprise. OK. So uh, moving to Arabidopsis, then Beata was able to use the uh, genetic uh, toolbox. And uh, with this hypothesis of ABA, she tested uh, mutants for the virus, various components of the ABA uh, signaling uh, pathway. And she pointed to uh, SNRK 2.6 as uh, the guy which was uh, actually not able to respond to the uh, ABA treatment. In Arabidopsis, we have to do it two days, because in two hours, Arabidopsis doesn't produce a lateral. So we wouldn't see a missing lateral in, in two hours. So thanks to the uh, help of uh, Tom, because I'm not a molecular biologist, neither a, develop a, a developmental biologist, 
uh, Beata has been able to use uh, the right tools and to show um, that we using a uh, Oxin uh, reporter. Um, for those who know Arabidopsis and natural root formation, when the root is growing on a petri dish with a certain angle, it grows in this S-shape and produces lateral every time there is a turn. Uh, that's a, a nice system that allows to synchronize the formation of lateral and to know where exactly the lateral should come. And so she was able to look before you see actually the lateral that you had those peaks of auxin forming. While uh, if you move to the, uh, in the presence of ABA, you see that once you move to, to you switch to ABA here, those one uh, future lateral primordia will actually be missing. So it's really a on and off and very uh, sharp response. Now, uh, using a luciferase assay, uh, it was then possible to show that ABA actually blocks the oscillation of the R5, uh, so the exine reporter that lay down uh, the prime site. So you see uh, the, the tip growing, then producing a lateral when it, well, producing a, 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 an oxygen peak uh, whenever it starts turning, the other one is actually not uh, doing this. Oops. So I come to try to make sense of this sort of uh, very short uh, in terms of time and also in terms of space, very short and quick responses uh, in terms of uh, natural formation. So we thought what can be varying in terms of water that would occur on a one, mil one millimeter scale in less than two hours. So it's not a change of water content due to drought. It's, it must be something different. So uh, going back to the uh, blue rain experiment, we started to look carefully in all routes that we had seen there, and it actually turned up that when a route enter a macropore, and you see the macropore here, uh, probably a, a, an earthworm gallery labeled in blue, it stops branching and will start branching again when it leaves. So it's not really convincing because you are just observing, and thanks to uh, Emily Morris and uh, Malcolm Bennett, uh, we were able to reproduce this in the uh, X-ray uh, CT set up in Nottingham where uh, the root is actually <laughs> growing in a soil where an artificial pore has been made and you see branching, it stops branching and it starts branching again. So this seems really to be a mechanism that will adapt locally, decision, do I branch or not? And it seems not to be a good idea to branch when you enter a macropore. Then we can start to discuss probably mechanics about uh, the reasons for that. Okay. I'm now entering my third avenue, so uh, trying to see <laughs> geometry is something. So we have seen that there are rules behind geometry. There, are also, there is also noise behind geometry. We have also seen that uh, plastic response needs to be contextualized uh, before we start to actually use them uh, for uh, yeah, breeding or whatever. Um, so the third avenue is uh, going beyond geometry. And the, the, the reason uh, I want to, to do this is actually if you follow uh, everywhere where water is actually flowing through and moving, uh, going across the soil plant uh, system, you, you quickly catch that there are many places, many scales, which can affect root water uptake and everyone with a specific context. So following uh, water, so water in the soil will get close to the root. When it gets close to the root, it has to accelerate its mass conservation. When it accelerates, the soil water potential reduces. So uh, you may have locally and transiently uh, episodes of loss of conductivity in the rhizosphere. So this is one type of events that can affect. So once water has reached the root surface, it has to go through this complex network of uh, apoplastic, uh, symplastic, cell-to-cell -cell pathways with different type of regulation. Putting a subrin or an endodermis is a long-term decision. Changing aquaporin expression is a very short-term decision. So these are all possible ways to uh, play with uh, hydraulic conductivity. Once the water has reached the xylem, it will be moving through the uh, axially to the xylem where a different type of uh, phenomenon can occur, then it's more a probabilistic 
type of thing, or the, the chance of having cavitation and blocking of vessels. And so this is all on a linear path. Now, if you take some distance from this, you have actually a connected network with soil nodes, root nodes. Soil and soil are interconnected. Soil and root are interconnected, and root and root segments are interconnected. So all these occur in, in a 2D, actually in a 3D or even 4D framework, if you take time into consideration. So uh, linking uh, soil water and root water uptake, the, the, the easy thing, the easy part is to say, well, we have a distribution of soil water over time. Then we have a distribution of roots. So the root will take up water depending on where it is and where they are. So root water uptake is a resulting uh, emerging process. And this will actually uh, lead to a new distribution of soil water. And the loop is going on over time. Well, roots are growing. Well, it's actually probably a bit more complicated than that. You have also <coughs> a short term loop because water is actually the soil water is actually affecting the distribution of the root hydraulic properties along the roots. And this one, on a very short time scale, will also affect root water uptake and the distribution of soil water. So if you, if you talk with engineers about this type of model, they say, wow, that's complicated. We, they are sometimes not sure to have the right tools to, to do it. But Francois Tardieu would say it's not because something is complicated that we can't try to do it. So now, um, this being said, it would be interesting to see if we can do better that, than what we have done. So simply the uh, geometry. So the, the graph on the left is the current formalism used by most uh, crop models to describe how to, to formulate uh, root water uptake. So the soil is split in uh, different layers. They are refilled by a sort of a bucket-like uh, process by rain. And uh, the way root geometry comes into the play is simply overlapping a map of, oh, in this case in the APSIM model, a map of soil occupancy. There is a root or there is no root in that layer. If there is a root, water will be taken up. If there is no root, it won't be. That's the way today we actually represent in our minds uh, the functioning of, uh, of that system. And I, I would call that root system architecture plus soil. It's a simple addition. If we try to be a little bit finer, and then you, sh you should go into the next talk uh, right now. Uh, Mathieu Javot is explaining the air swims model. So, but the, 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 door, the, door, the, the wall is closed. Uh, you can actually, and there are tools that allow you to simulate fluxes in this uh, com complex system that I mentioned here with all the equation for different uh, type of fluxes. Now, uh, experimentally, uh, Valentin Couvreur and uh, Guillaume Lobet, that was the, uh, something from the uh, thesis of uh, Guillaume Lobet, uh, designed, uh, used that R swims model to uh, simulate the fluxes of water in the soil and in the root system. So this is a picture of the soil water contents in a rhizotron. That's experimental. Uh, during a one day and a half of a dry down experiment. So maize has been growing until the rhizotron was full of roots. And during uh, a bit more than one day, uh, they just stopped watering. And you see the uh, evolution of water contents in this. So the, the, the intuitive interpretation is, OK, the plant is taking up water up, and then we'll be taking up water down. So uh, using the soil properties and the root architecture, it was possible to simulate what actually would be happening uh, if the model was correct. And this seems to be quite similar to what uh, the experiment said. Now we can go into the internal variables of the model. And there is one variable in the model that we cannot access experimentally, except for those who have seen Muta's uh, talk this morning, is the sink term. So where water was actually entering the roots. And what you see is that from the very beginning, the root was actually taken up everywhere in the root system, <coughs> not only in the top. So when you discuss with the soil hydrologist and say, can you make this a simple explanation for us? They will tell you, well, you take a glass 
of soda, you put a straw in it, you drink from the bottom, but water is moving from the top. Might be simple. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so we can make some prediction from uh, those models. Uh, how far am I in terms of time? Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay, should be okay. Um, I will skip the next one. So something we can do in terms of you, you by using those uh, those tool is actually uh, start to play. That's called sensitivity analysis. Play with the parameters of the model to see what parameter will have an effect on water uptake and what parameter will not have an effect on water uptake. But it's only simulation. So uh, two important terms uh, in, in the model are the radial conductance of the route. So it's based on the composite transport theory. There you have a coprin expression. The aging of the route with the production of apoplastic barriers comes into play. And then Kx is the axial conductance, so the conductance of the xylem, essentially the diameter of the xylem and the number of xylem poles. And both those can be actually manipulated by breeding. So uh, you have here the reference situation, which is based on what we saw in the rhizotrons. If you decrease the ratio of the radial to the axial, that means you, you reduce the axial conductivity of the roots relatively to the uh, you reduce the, the radial, sorry. Or if you increase the radial conductivity, you have as a function of depth the sink term, so how much water has been taken up. And the different colors are different time points. So what you see is that in the reference scenario, essentially water is taken up in pr as a proportion of root length density, which is a dust line. That makes sense. If you decrease the axial, the radial component, then you see that suddenly water starts to be taken up evenly throughout the whole root system and through the whole depth. And this is a change you can achieve by changing a coprin expression, for example, in one hour. And then you go back to another situation. So this turns up, could be, because this is simulation, a very dynamic system switching from one state to another. On the opposite, if you increase the xylem size, most of the water will be actually taken up from the top profile and very little uh, from the bottom. So I will skip this one, as I said. Uh, now, behind this radial conductivity, uh, we have this composite transport model that has always, be always been described as equivalent to one or two, maybe three cells uh, in sequence with an apoplastic barrier in between. So what we, we developed, and that's the work of uh, Valentin Couvreur and Mathieu Javot, is a uh, model where we actually start from a real cross-section that we digitize, and then we have uh, for every wall, every membrane, every plasmodesmata is actually represented in uh, this model. So to convince you that this doesn't tell us, tell us uh, completely stupid things, um, so you see the color here show the flux rate in the, in the wall and it's essentially radially moving, not really much on the circumference, radially moving towards the, uh, the steel. Then when we get closer to the endodermis, you see the, 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 the dots here are the plasma desmata and the inner side of the uh, cell is the, uh, the plasma membrane fluxes. You see that water starts to enter the cells massively and to leak out of the cell through the plasma desmata, which makes sense. Intuitively, that's what we would say, and well, the, sometimes the model tells us what we know. Um, and then uh, this allows us to compute over from the uh, root surface to the xylem, the proportion of the different pathway used by water. So the contribution of the apoplastic, the symplastic, and the cell-to-cell -cell, uh, pathway in situation where the Endodermis is, the, the exodermis is not developed and we have a young endodermis and in situation where you have an exodermis and a developed uh, endodermis. Now, and this is my last uh, result slide, is we have all these species at the root system scale, at the organ scale, at the uh, developmental scale. What can we do with all of that? It's not getting too complicated. So we have those experimental results of uh, uh, radial anatomy. We have those results about uh, 
lateral variability. From this, using the model I showed previously, we can simulate what is the radial conductivity, and then we can start playing with patterns of aquaponic expression. Well, it's with a model, you can do many things. Starting from those data, you can start to stimulate complete root system that actually reproduce this uh, variability. Then you connect all the models together using the R-SWIMS model, and you end up with very integrative variables, such as the evolution of the, water, uh, the plant water potential as a function of time during a dry dome experiment. Uh, during a dry dome experiment. So you see this variation, day, night, makes sense, open stomata, water potential decrease, you close it, comes back again, and as a function of time, you see the effect of the soil drying with the maximum which decreases. Now, what we have done with the model, the cyan color is the reference one, so the one from the experiment. We have tried to increase the proportion of fast-growing laterals. Would that be a good idea? There is no carbon allocation part in the model, so we don't know how much it costs. But does it pay off in terms of water uptake? And you see that it's a little bit improved the uh, status of the plants uh, during the day. Then you can try to say, okay, let's, let's make them uh, many, uh, sorry, la, 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 um, reference, mean, let's decrease the number of lateral roots. If you decrease the number of lateral roots, you get to the blue line, the, the fast growing lateral roots. So you say, okay, that's normal. I'm going much less distance from the root, makes sense. And then you say, what if all the lateral would grow at the same rate? And this is where you get to the red one, which is the worst thing you could do. So what the model tells us is that this intrinsic variability is, could be an essential part of maintenance of uh, the uh, plant water potential. Okay, uh, yeah, I have to stop because uh, I wanted to show you this is a, a, an, an ugly slide. Uh, but uh, and anyway, it's too long, but uh, the, the, the message is we have been trained to focus on reproducible phenomena. And so the noise is something that we don't like. It's most of the time, it's a residual term in our statistical models. Probably the noise sometimes should be part of what we are actually looking for. Uh, up, 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 up. We will better understand plasticity if we think in a multi-scale integrative soil plant framework. And uh, I thank you very much. I just have you, if you like to, to play with those models, there is a nice uh, website. It's for teaching in Wallonia, so it has to be partly in French. But there is not much text, and there is a lot of English also as well. So uh, if you want to play with those online, uh, Guillaume is actually uh, making this with Felicia and Valentin. Thank you very much.